Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. My favorite part. Welcome to today's program at the Commonwealth Club of California, which is the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. Every year, we present more than 450 forums on topics ranging across politics, culture, society, and the economy. It is a delight to see so many faces in the audience today and I thank you for taking the time to attend this in-person event at the club, which was sold out. <laughs> for those of you attending the program virtually, I extend a warm welcome and invite you to return to an in-person event as soon as possible. There are many fascinating programs listed on the club's website, www.commonwealthclub.org, and tomorrow night I'm going to hear the great-grandson of President Theodore Roosevelt talk about his new book, The Country That Never Was. So I encourage you to come join me then, too. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to draw your attention to a few people in this audience who have guided the club through the pandemic. Dr. Gloria Duffy, our CEO has really navigated dangerous waters as the club rapidly pivoted from in-person programs and events to 100% virtual. The technical team here at the club, headed by Mark Kirshner in the corner there, has been extraordinarily adept at this transition, and they are part of an expert staff, including Adam, and Billy, who you heard from earlier, who have really delivered. Thanks to all of you. Our board chair, Martha Ryan. Please stand up, Martha. Martha Ryan's our board chair, and she has a strong commitment to strengthening the club in many ways as we prepare for a new hybrid model of programming in person and virtual. And as a member of the board myself, I witness her energy and drive. Thank you, Martha. Well, the program you are a part of today has been created through a collaboration of three, three member-led forums my own, health and medicine. We have worked with Gerald Harris. Please stand up, Gerald. He's the chair of technology and society. And Andrew Dudley, who's over there in the corner. Stand up to Andrew. He's chair of people and nature. And the chair of all the member-led forums, our boss, really, here at the club is Dr. Carol Fleming. Stand up, Carol. And Carol champions this unique aspect of the club, which is available to all members. It's a privilege of membership. If you have a particular interest, it could be society and technology or health and medicine, you can reach out via the website to any of the chairs, and we're going to be running meetings that you can join, okay? Carol, you're a great inspiration to me personally. <clears throat> I'm almost done, John. I have to, I have to cover it. The original idea for this event was brought to my attention by Michael Menictus, uh, who's actually, Michael, stand up. He's actually a member of the Hog Island Board. And without Michael, I would never have reached out to John. So there's a lot of connections in this room. So moving on to our speaker today, at last, you say. I am delighted to welcome John Finger, who is president and CEO of the Hog Island Oyster Company, which he co-founded in 1983, based in Marshall on Tomales Bay in Marin County, with uh, a, a, gr a growing area up in Eureka. He and his team produce oysters on a large scale sustainably. John is a marine biologist by training, 
and someone who is at the cutting edge of climate change and the need to embrace science and technology to ensure there will be oysters in our future. Because they could go extinct. Today's format is that John will give us a talk about his world of oysters, and then I will meet here in front of you and have a conversation. Your questions will be brought up. Uh, those of you online can put them in the chat on the YouTube. And uh, well, that's about it. Uh, after the program, we're going to move to the fourth floor to enjoy some wine and the oysters that you have produced for us. So, John, please come forward. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Robbie, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club. This is a huge honor. This is a I can't remember. Any, I got so excited when I saw the gavel up here. I don't know how many times I've heard that on the radio, listening to, listen to the talks, and I was like, "Wow!" And try to calm down and not talk too fast. So, <laughs> anyhow, I thought before I, I delved into the Hog Island story, I'd give a little context in terms of of, of oysters and the history of oysters on the west coast of the United States. Um, so, of course, we weren't the first oyster bar in the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> the Native Americans and Miwok and Ohlone people um, subsisted in large part on, on, on shellfish, on oysters, clams, and mussels that were, were very abundant in the area. So as, we, as most, of you, <coughs> most of you probably know, we have middens, which are shell piles, you know, kitchen middens, with lots and lots of shells all over the Bay Area. Um, this one, this, this picture always blows me away. Does anybody know where this is? This is where IKEA is now over in Emeryville. This is the, Emery, this is the Emeryville Shell Mound, okay, which is one of, the, one of the largest shell middens ever found. So, and it was all excavated out for, I think it was a paint factory at the time in the 1920s. So, um, so the oyster that these native peoples were eating is what we call the Olympia oyster. The Olympia oyster, um, unlike the eastern oyster, the eastern oyster forms very um, large three-dimensional reefs in a lot of the bays on the east coast. The Olympia oyster uh, is one is very slow growing, um, only gets to be a half a dollar size in about three years, and it also only formed low fringing reefs, very low in the intertidal around the edges of the bay. So uh, those two things and the gold rush kind of were the beginning of the end for the Olympia oyster. Slow growing, high demand, um, people started over harvesting the oysters in the San Francisco Bay Area, and even, you know, Olympia oysters occurred in pretty good numbers from Baja, California, all the way up to Vancouver Island at one point in time. After they wiped them out in the Bay Area, they were getting them from Washington State. Sort of the, really the death knell of the, of the Olympia oyster in San Francisco Bay is the latter part of the gold rush and the hydraulic mining that took place. Silt came down, those low fringing reefs got, got buried. Um, so people were out here, Western Europeans were out here, had to have oysters. Um, in 1873, the Transcontinental Railroad got completed, and some people thought, gee, we can bring oysters from the East Coast out here, and why not bring small oysters out here and finish growing them out here rather than you know, bringing big, bulky oysters out here? So that happened in 1873, actually, in San Francisco Bay, Tomales Bay, and Willapa Bay up in Washington State. And the San Francisco Bay was fairly large business for quite a while. So large that, that um, oh, actually I skipped over this one. This is, this is just a little slide about Placerville, which, does everybody know the nickname of Placerville? Hangtown. Hangtown, Hangtown. right? And the famous dish? Hangtown, Hangtown Fry. Fry. Lots of Olympia oysters went into Hangtown Fry, which is, you know, led to the demise. But anyhow, getting back to the, to the 1870s and the Transcontinental Rail Railroad, um, people started growing oysters, finishing oysters out here in San Francisco Bay to the point there were actually oyster pirates. And this is one of the, when I give my staff staff tours, this is the, the oyster factoid that you can really impress your friends and neighbors with. So Jack London as a teenager was an oyster pirate and he was pirating the eastern oyster grown in San Francisco Bay. So that would be the really, the, the, the nerdy factoid for, for impressing friends and neighbors. So. Um, he actually, I think, became at one point in time a member of the, of the, actually, the oyster police that roamed the bay as well, trying to catch the oyster pirates. So, anyhow, in the 1920s, some people up in Washington State uh, decided to bring the Pacific or Japanese oyster over. 
again, um, similar to what they did with the eastern oyster, packing them in sawdust, packing them in seaweed, anything to keep them damp on the journey across the Pacific. And they were seed oysters that were set on scallop shells usually, and then put into some bays in Washington state. That oyster naturalized up there, which meant it had the ability to start reproducing on its own up there and became the, the industry in the, on the West Coast, um, especially up in Washington state. The Pacific oyster, unlike the Olympia, is hardy, it's very fast growing, uh, and it really became the mainstay on the whole West Coast of the United States. Um, and once those oysters naturalized, um, you know, they got an a, a, a easier seed source year in and year out. Um, but in Mother Nature, what happens with, with oysters is they put a lot of energy into reproductive rights. But the success rate on reproduction is very, very low. So a female Pacific oyster will produce, you know, 10 million eggs. They mix in the water column with sperm. We have external fertilization. We have larvae that are now part of the planktonic community out there. Less than one-tenth of 1% 1 make that transition to the next phase. So 99.9% .9 failure rate, which is why they produce 10 million eggs, right? So, so the basic way of farming oysters was to try to improve on those odds by putting some sort of substrate out there that they would like to set on, either bags of shell, um, in France, they would use terracotta roof tiles covered with a limestone slurry cement mixture, anything to increase those odds. Um, but still, what happens is you could have a bad year where you don't have a good spawning cycle. You could put the substrate out too early and other things start growing on it. So what really, really got oyster farming going in a big way was in the development of hatchery technology in the 1970s. So we now have a hatchery up in, in Humboldt Bay. We'll talk about that a little bit later here. But that allowed us to now, on land, pumping seawater in, manipulate water temperatures, growing algae in, in, in greenhouses to mimic summer, to get the oysters to put energy into reproduction, to produce the eggs, produce the sperm, monitor that whole process. When they're getting ready to settle and lose the ability to swim, they form an eye spot and they look like little grains of pepper in the water, introduce substrate at that point in time, and now your success rate is anywhere from 30 to 50%. Way, way better than that. 0.1%. So, um, anyhow, that leads to us. This is my partner, Mike, and myself when I started the company in 1983. Um, the, the interesting thing is when we started the oyster company, there's two basic ways when you have hatchery technology to grow oysters. There's one is you have whole shell, much like the, the, the shell that you would put out to catch the spat out in the bay. And then you get clusters of oysters when you're growing it that way, right? And that was done worldwide. It's very easy to do. You don't have to hold the animals on land very long. You can put those shells out with the baby oysters on and let them grow up. But you get very low yields that way. You might get out of 50 baby oysters on an oyster shell, you might get five that make it the market size. They grow into each other and grow into clusters. And at some point off, you can hit them with a hammer and they break apart. The eastern oyster, they, their, their growth is fairly slow, and at some point in time, you can break them apart and get an, an animal that's suitable for the half shell. The Pacific oyster, because it's so fast growing, they're about this big before you could actually break the clusters apart. So when we started, we were one of the early adopters of um, what's called single seed, seed technology, um, which is we grind the shell into 200 micron shell powder before we, we introduced the tanks to the set. So now you have individual little oysters. Now you can manipulate the shell quality, the oysters, create a nice half shell oyster, right? We started doing that because I had seen some of this in Europe um, and we, we knew this was possible, but in the Bay Area at that point in time, if you went anywhere to get an oyster on a half shell, it was a Blue Point oyster, which is incredibly frustrating to me. I'm from Long Island, New York. Blue Point had been horribly polluted for decades. It wasn't an oyster coming out of that that anybody would eat. And yet everywhere around you, you saw blue points. And it was an uphill battle for us to convince people that you could eat Pacific oysters raw in the half shell. We did a couple of smart things. You know, one, we, we um, decided to get a name that was unique, Hog Island, and asked people to put the oysters on the menu that way. And then a good friend of mine, my college buddy, who had just started the distrib distribution business, was a consummate salesperson, had connections. Our first two accounts were Chez Panisse and Zuni Cafe. 
Put the name Hog Island on the menu. Next thing, there's magazines calling, and boom, there we go. So that's, that's how we got the whole thing going. But it was very, very interesting in the beginning trying to get that going. And, and part of it is really about right time, right place, too. I mean, that really was the California food movement. You know, I'm sure we might have been successful without that, but we were just really at the right time at the right place. For me, you know, looking forward, I think in the mid-90s, one of my one of my personal coups was going into the Grand Central Oyster Bar in New York and actually getting them to, to serve my oysters from the, the Pacific Coast and that back in New York. So that was kind of a watershed moment for me. So, so here we are, 40 years later, a little more gray. This is Terry Sawyer, who's my current operating partner in the business. Um, he joined us five years in, in 1988, and we, uh, we lured him away from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. He was one of the, one of the, the first aquarists there and, and uh, knows a lot more about technology and engineering than I do, so, so it worked out well. So, um, This is a picture of our farm up in Tamales Bay, and this is still, you know, I, I, Sure, most of us know the, know the company and we have restaurants and all this stuff, but this is the foundation of the, of the company. This is what we're all about. This is a picture of a, what we call our rack and bag culture. So rack and bag culture was developed in France post-World War II. We were one of the, we're one of the biggest um, operators of rack and bag culture in the United States. You're, you're growing those oysters again. Remember, they're single oysters, so we can't just throw them out anywhere because they'll get buried in the mud or in, in the case of Tamales Bay, we'll actually get eaten by bat rays um, and other predators out there. Um, we get them up off the bottom, keeps them a little cleaner, and increases the water flow. When you're growing oysters, it's all about water flow. We talk about it all about place. You know, we'll talk about the sustainability a little later, but you know, we're not feeding, we're not fertilizing. It's really about just, just giving them their best shot at the, at the best amount of food and water and oxygen. Um, we also now grow a couple other different types of oysters. This is a, a, a system that's from Australia called the SEPA basket that rocks gently in the wind and wave action. That helps sometimes when you're growing single seed oysters, what you're trying to do is trying to ensure that they all get access to the same good water, right? So if you have a container and you have oysters on the outer edge and they're getting more food and more water, they get bigger. The bigger they get, the more food and water they steal from everybody else. So your job is to take the bullies away and let the runs come up. These actually help us do that because they actually move them around a little bit so we don't have to do it by hand. This is a more aggressive way of doing that. This is called a tipping bag oyster or tumble farm. And now this is being practiced very widely up in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of the oysters we bring into our oyster bars are tumbled oysters, the Chelsea Gems, Hama Hama Blue Pools, these kind. So these go up and down every day with the tidal cycle. We have about a six foot tidal range in Tamales Bay that that line there is about at a, at a three foot tide level. So they go vertical to high tide and they go vertical to low tide and that tumbles them around. So, um, so we've talked about Pacific oysters. Um, we also, this is a picture of me. These are some seed oysters um, for the Eastern oyster variety <coughs> from Rutgers actually. So we, one of the few farms that grows, still grows the Eastern oyster out here. I started that in the 1980s. It's a really great summer oyster for us in terms of seasons of, of, of shellfish. Um, it's at times been very difficult to get seed. Um, we, you know, thinking back to what I was just telling you about how we, we, I say we, 150 years ago wasn't me, it was other people. Um, <laughs> people brought oysters from the East Coast, people brought oysters from Japan. When they did that, they'd intro they introduced pests and diseases. We have uh, both uh, Japanese oyster drills and eastern oyster drills in Tamales Bay um, that can actually drill through a shell and, and kill the oyster. We have other diseases that have been exported around. So now, when we're bringing seed in from a hatchery anywhere we, we want to do this, it has to have two years of disease-free and pest-free history, both for the seed and adults in that area. We are very, very careful how we do that. Um, we'll talk a little bit again. You know, we now have a hatchery of our own up in Humboldt Bay. When I go up there, I have to wash my car. I park on the back side of the building. I don't wear the same boots because we have a few diseases in Tamales Bay that they don't have in Humboldt Bay. And so we're really, the biosecurity these days is much, much different than, than the 1870s. <laughs> so anyhow, in addition to the Eastern or Atlantic oyster, so we grow the Pacific oyster. And I did want to mention too, the Pacific oyster is the most widely cultured oyster and one of the most widely cultured marine organisms in the world. 
Okay, it is extensively cultured in Japan, where it's native to, China, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and all of Western Europe. I mean, if you're going to get oysters in Western Europe, most likely you are getting Pacific oysters, and now the West Coast of the United States. Um, so we, of course, grow the Pacifics. That's our hog on sweet water. We grow the Eastern or Atlantics, which is the one to the left. The upper left there are the Kumamoto's, and we are one of the few farms that grows a European flat oyster. That's the upper right there, which is the native Western Europe oyster. They're very hard to grow. They're a bit finicky. They're French. What can I say? <laughs> um, so, and, it, and some people call them Belon. We are not allowed to call them Belon. That's like calling our sparkly wine champagne. Okay, so we want to get that right. So, <laughs> anyhow, and I think um, Gary, who helped me, my, my staff of colleges, helped me put this slideshow together. We are the only farm that grows all five species in one estuary. There are other farms who grow these different types, but not in one bay. We do all this in Tomales Bay. So, you know, we, we were successful in getting our name out there. We joked around a lot about rich and famous. You know, we figured out the famous part early on. We're still working on the rich part. <laughs> but um, it's difficult to make it in the Bay Area as a farmer. You know, when we wholesaled oysters, we sold oysters all around the country, um, even into the Far East. Um, but what really started changing for us, and we always knew we wanted to go direct to consumers, is we put a, a filtered seawater system in to keep our oysters in in Marshall, um, partly to do with, with wintertime rainfall closes, which we'll talk about. And when we did that, we went, gee, if we open the gates, we can sell to people. And that really started a whole domino effect of our retail on, on Route 1, putting a picnic area in, some people saying you should put barbecues in, to the point of even in 2003, the year before we opened San Francisco, which is November 2003, half our revenue was now coming from direct-to-consumer. So that really started to change our perspective on things. Then the ferry building approached us in 2002. We opened in November 2003, and that was a game changer. That doubled the number of people and the revenue of our company in the space of a year. Um, and, you know, it's been from that point onward, you know, deciding, okay, what do we, what do we want to do with this? So here we are. Some of you have been here. I've talked to a few of this. This is our latest location in Marin Country Mart, the old Larkspur Landing um, in Marin County, in southern Marin County. And I was just talking to someone earlier. We were a week away from opening this when the shelter in place happened. <laughs> 30 people hired, a week of training under our belt, and had to send everybody home. And this is successful. We, we, this place has done amazingly well, beat our first year projections, even given the pandemic, due to the support we have from a lot of our customers. So a good story there. Um, we also, so it's funny, we have, we have a funny saying in the company. We talked about reluctant growth. I mean, this company is way bigger than I ever thought it would be. I never wanted to have a big company. I'd worked for a, a big company before I started Hog Island. Um, but we make decisions about making the company stronger. <laughs> And one of the things is talking about integrated growth. You know, we knew we wanted to diversify how we sold oysters, not just through wholesale, but through restaurants and a couple of different locations. But we wanted to have a diversity in production and a resilient supply chain. Um, so we started backing into that up in Humboldt Bay. So <clears throat> these are pictures of what's called flupsies. They're called floating upwell systems. Those are large rafts, which are about 100 feet long, that we grow, we produce about 20 million one inch seed oysters out of this facility a year now. This started in 2014. Um, and this, and then we backed in further into, into um, a nursery operation and a hatchery operation. <clears throat> and this allowed us to really control so much more of the process all along the way. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of even genetics of what we're growing. This is the seed barge that's right next to that. This is, this is, um, these guys are sorting seed, and this is where the seed comes to when it's about a millimeter and a half, up to four millimeters. They're in tanks there that we pump water up out of the bay into. Um, this is the size of the seed. If you can kind of see on the hand, you know, that's probably 10,000 oysters on my hand there. Um, that's what one millimeter or millimeter and a half seed oysters looks like. And this is coming out of our hatchery. This is our newest addition up in Humboldt Bay. The hatchery, like I mentioned earlier, we're growing, growing algae in greenhouses to feed these animals. 
Um, you have to feed not only the adults to get them to spawn, you have to feed the larvae as they're going through their two weeks to get ready for metamorphosis, and then feed them till they get to be about a millimeter in size, and then we kick them out in the building, and then they're on natural food from that point onward. Um, this is the newest, newest thing up there. We finally got permits after several years to do another farm in Humboldt Bay because we wanted to make sure on the market side we had diversity as well. And these are those SEPA baskets I was showing you. I was just, just up there the last week. So we just started construction on this about three months ago, and we hope to have some of our first market product probably the second half of next year. And the exciting thing about Humboldt Bay is I really do think it's the best place on the West Coast to grow Kumamoto oysters. So we've already got a half a million Kumamotos planted out there. So keep an eye out for those. So. <clears throat> So here we are, all these years later, next year is going to be 40 years, where, where uh, yeah, I was four years old when I started the company, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, you know, close to $30 million a year operation, over half a million guests served a year. We are a legal California benefit corporation, if people know what that is, we can talk about that later. Um, we have five restaurant locations, the mail order division, traveling oyster bars, we do an education outreach to over two to 3,000 people a year, the farm retail, and we have 105, 159 shareholders, many of them employee shareholders to date. So, so we'll see what comes next. Now getting to some of the environmental stuff. This is a quote by Rowan Jacobson, who's a really a good friend of ours and, and author. He's written a couple of books on oysters, one called The Geography of Oysters, another one called The Essential Oyster. Oysters are the canary in the coal mine. If you can eat the oysters, the watershed is doing pretty well. Um, and that's very true from a lot of, a lot of different perspective. Um, it, it's interesting. I'm going to back up here for a second and make sure I do the right button here. So, um, <clears throat> why oysters in a way? I always like telling this story. So again, I grew up on the East coast on East End, Long Island, New York, fishing, clamming, hunting. The only seafood I didn't eat was oysters. <laughs> didn't like them, never studied them in college, never even took an invertebrate zoology class. I was a fish guy. I wanted to raise fish. I could see even in the late 70s that the, the wild seafood of the world was not going to be able to keep up with demand and we needed to be able to farm seafood. So I wanted to farm salmon or trout or striped bass. Um, I did an internship in California. Being a surfer thought it'd be a fun place to live for a couple of years. Came back out, started knocking on doors and got a job for an oyster company. Um, and I really fell in love with the environmental aspect of the business. Um, you know, the fact that you need a healthy estuary to grow oysters in, both for the oysters themselves and for the human health aspects. You know, there are only, so we've lost many places in this country we used to be able to harvest shellfish from for consumption. And it means something that we have bays that are that clean. Um, and then just the whole being part of a well-functioning estuary. We'll talk about that. The oysters and filter feeders help estuaries become healthy. Um, one thing I do like to talk about before we go into the next slide is, is in this country, <clears throat> anywhere you're going to harvest shellfish, you're regulated on water quality. So we're constantly testing the waters at Tamales Bay. And what we test for is fecal coliform bacteria. Fecal coliform bacteria in and of itself isn't going to make people sick, but it's an indicator of warm-blooded fecal matter in the water, which can lead to viruses and other associated bacteria. But to give you a frame of reference, fecal coliform bacteria is used as a standard for other uses. So there's a use called non-contact recreation. If you want to go wading, canoeing in a body of water, your average of your last five samples need to be less than 2,000 most probable number per milliliter of seawater. Okay? If you want to go swimming, everybody's seen beaches that are posted, correct? That's less than 200 most probable number per milliliter of seawater. If you want to directly harvest shellfish, it's less than 14, most probable number per milliliter of seawater. That's why it's important that we have shellfish farms in some of our estuaries, because the amount of water quality monitored and goes on and continues to go on. So, you know, we do a lot of work. You know, Terry and I talk a lot about go to more meetings than I ever thought I'd, I'd ever go to, but we were founding members of the Tomas Bay Watershed Council. I used to go to Dairy Waste Committee meetings to talk to guys about, about things. Terry's on the board of the Resource Conservation District, which is largely a landowner organization that helps grants for streamside fencing, these kinds of things. And so, but we really feel like if you take the long view, you have to be involved in these things. 
So we all know oysters are amazing filters. Um, you know, a full-grown Pacific oyster can filter up to 50 gallons a day. And you can see a, an acre of a sort of a natural oyster reef can filter an amazing amount of water. That's really important because in most of our estuaries, if anything, we have too many inputs. And too many inputs leads to too dense of algae blooms. And if you don't have filter feeders in the estuary, everything gets out of balance. So again, the oysters are an indicator that the bay is healthy, but they also help the bay to be healthy. There's a lot of, there's estuaries in this <coughs> country where they're trying to bring more oysters and more filter feeders in to benefit the eelgrass, which is a habitat for many other species, because there's greater sunlight penetration if you have the filter feeders in the area. So, um, the other part that I really like, and we've done work over the years with, with various academic institutions, is the habitat value of shellfish. This is actually something that um, by uh, the Nature Conservancy put together, um, which shows that, you know, for mussel culture, for oyster culture, for clam culture, they all have a greater abundance and a greater diversity of species in among the culture gear than you would in a reference site. We actually have an ongoing study right now with, with uh, somebody from UCSC looking at just this, looking at our habitat use and what kind of species are using it and what times of the year. And this is what I love about it. When I think about sustainability, I think about biodiversity as being something. Because water flow is so important to us, we can't fence everything out. So, and the nooks and crannies of the shells themselves create this great habitat. We might not be making a, a rustic looking reef out there, but it's still some of the same benefits that happen within an oyster farm. Of course, we're not the only ones who say this. So this is uh, from the Seafood Watch program. And you can see on best choices, of course, you've got clams and mussels and oysters, you know, are always on there as some of your best choices. Now, again, they're very low on this food chain, too. So it's easier to be sustainable the lower on the food chain you are. Um, I got to remember which, which I'm clicking this, not that. <laughs> you know, and recently, too, a lot of people have, have, have leaned in on this conversation about, you know, blue foods and how do we, how do we feed more people? Um, so you can hear, see here from the future of food from the sea, nature journal, UN oceans conference. There's a lot of interest in, can we feed more people? Can we create more nutritious food from the sea? So, um, this is something that's near and dear to our hearts. Of course, you know, we, we think a lot about, about this, um, this is a chart just showing sort of the nutritional benefits of, of different food types. And you can see that, you know, shellfish, as well as, as, as some of the small pelagics and fish, you know, have a great nutritional benefit, right? They do this at the same time, they have a very low environmental impact, right? We're gonna talk about CO2 emissions and why that's particularly important to us in the shellfish business. Um, but you can see here that you know, aquaculture has very low CO2 emissions here, at least the, the mariculture that happens in marine waters. So um, you know, one of the notes we have here is if you look at you know, a pound of a, a, a one hamburger has roughly the same carbon footprint as nine pounds of wild sardines. You know, that's, that's about 36 servings of sardines, or about close to 50 servings of oysters, right? Again, once we get past the hatchery and our end of the game, there's not a lot, there's not inputs. You know, there's not a lot of energy. There's not a lot of fresh water use, which is the other big one I always like bringing up here. This was from a, uh, a Bren School of the Environment down at UCSB talking about, hey, if we're going to produce additional protein in the world, what would the impacts be? And again, if you look at kelp and unfed aquaculture, which is what we're talking about with shellfish, you know, you can do that without using a lot of fresh water, which I, particularly in this state, I think is very, very important. Um, of course, there's not a lot of land usage either. That is kind of obvious, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I always like to point out is, is, is this whole thing about, you know, wild versus farmed and all that kind of thing. That, that cow left the barn a long time ago. So today, over half the seafood consumed in the world is farmed and not fished. So... Now, it's not quite that way in this country because a lot of that is carp and catfish and, these, and tilapia in other countries. But again, you can see here the wild fisheries you know, have, have somewhat plateaued out. You know, we've, we've, 
We're managing some of them sustainability in, sustainably in this country, but we're not going to get a lot more seafood from hunting wild seafood. We are from farming seafood. Speaking of canaries in the coal mine, <laughs> this is, the, this is our, one of our big new challenges here is ocean acidification. So um, I don't know, it's, it's going back a ways, but I, I remember sitting, I think I was actually in a theater and watching <clears throat> An Inconvenient Truth and seeing the CO2 graph and going, I, can't, I guess I shouldn't curse here, but whoa, we are, we are screwing ourselves here. So in... <clears throat> 2007, we started seeing problems with hatcheries in the Pacific Northwest. Prior to that, we didn't have our own hatchery. Hatcheries are very expensive to, to both build and, and to, to operate. But what was happening is, is there were big blooms of a, of a bacteria called Vibrio tubiashi that people thought were to blame. And there was a lot of research going into why we're having these big crashes of, of, of hatchery production up there. Um, under further review, they realized that it had to do with some of the high wind conditions, especially in the spring and in early summer. And what they noticed is the pH of the water was dropping dramatically. In some cases from, you know, ocean water, it wants to be around 8.2 down to 7.6. You know, on a logarithmic scale, that's a, that's a big drop. So to oversimplify this whole thing, when that happens, when ocean water becomes more acidic, and I'll back up a second. The reason this is happening is we have this great upwelling that happens off this coast, right? Everybody knows it's very nutrient rich. It has to do with our northwest wind sending the surface waters down coast. The upwelling comes up. Very nutrient rich water. It's also somewhat acidic and becoming more acidic because it's ocean water that's been around a long time with decaying matter going along the bottom of the oceans, coming around this side and getting upwelled up. Normally, when it comes up to the surface, it mixes with surface water, which is not acidic, and everything's hunky-dory. As we have an increasing amount of CO2 that we put in the atmosphere, that surface water no longer is ameliorating that. And so we have this more acidic condition. What happens is now calcium carbonate, which is what shell-forming creatures, not just oysters and clams, but any shell-forming creatures need to form that shell, gets harder for them to grab onto particularly what's called aragonite. Aragonite's a very soluble form of calcium carbonate. It's what oysters seed, those microscopic larvae need to make their first shells. If they have to work too hard to get that, they get attacked by the vibrios and all those other things, and that's what we found out was happening. So you can see on the picture here, um, I don't know if I could try this pointer or not. This is a normal metamorphosis of shells from day one to day two to day three, okay? If you lower the pH of the water on the right is what happens. You start seeing erosion of the shell here. And you can see what was leading to these big crashes in the hatcheries. So um, there was a paper that came out. Some of the, some of the people involved there um, started looking into this and realizing that there was an ocean chemistry issue. And <clears throat> with help from NOAA, what was developed is called the IU system, which is Interagency Ocean observation system, which is what we're now part of. So that map now that you see in your left is looking at along the west coast here, all the assets that are part of the IU system. And the California one is called Senkus, which is Central and Northern California Ocean Observation System. Um, and there are some that are gliders that are, that are looking at ocean chemistry, and there are some that are land-based. Those red circles represent our facility in Tomales Bay and our facility in Humboldt Bay. We have two of these real-time monitoring stations. So you can go online and actually look at real-time ocean chemistry on any of these sites. And so what we're trying to do now is we all, we all know this is happening to ocean chemistry. What happens in individual bays? Are there things that help or hurt with this, with this phenomenon? The other thing that is great, because it's real-time, we can actually buffer seawater as it comes into the hatchery using soda ash or crust up oyster shell to make sure that we avoid some of these corrosive conditions. So that's, that's sort of where we're at right now in terms of trying to ameliorate this. We're also trying, again, to breed oysters that can handle a warmer ocean, a more acidic ocean. As a biologist, what you get concerned with is not the absolute change, but is the rate of change. And the rate of change at this point in time is not very good in terms of how fast it is. And this is something we're trying to get ahead of. 
And like I said, hatcheries are something I avoided doing for 35 years. They're very expensive and very tricky, but we feel we have no other choice but to start to breeding more resilient shellfish for what's to come. With that, this is my, my last slide. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, beyond sustainability towards a regenerative food system with blue foods at the center. This is a, a good picture because this is showing one of our newer efforts as well. We finally got permits to harvest all the seaweed that's growing all over our gear. This was a bit of a red tape story, but that picture that <clears throat> in the very foreground, the darker seaweed is essentially a, a type of nori that we get for a few months. And then the green seaweed is all over a sea lettuce, both really good edible seaweeds. We're going to start playing around with drying those and, and making certain food products out of those as well. And again, seaweeds are great because they really can help buffer the situation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Robbie. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there was a question here. Um, Fabulous presentation, Bobby. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Round of applause. I learned a ton, and I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, one of the questions was, uh, what are the limits imposed on you to expand uh, into Mollus Bay? Uh, <laughs> very, very interesting question. So, so when I started... Hagen Oyster Company, I actually started it out here. I was intending to go back east because it was easier to permit new farms in California than it was on the east coast, and that has totally reversed. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with, with competing uses in, the, in a lot of these estuaries, recreational uses. There, there are bays in France and Japan you can go to, and you won't see anything but shellfish culture. So uh, the permitting landscape has gotten very onerous and very expensive in California. Um, We've been trying to, a couple of us have been trying to make that easier. I'd love to see some newer, younger people get involved in this business. So we've been working with, with so we have to go through uh, permits with the uh, California Coastal Commission and then uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife weighs in, uh, California Department of Health Services. We also have to get permits from the Army Corps of Engineers, which means National Marine Fishery Service weighs in. Um, so there's a lot of agencies and we're trying to get a, a little bit more efficient permit process together to see if we can do that. We, that new farm in Humboldt Bay, uh, we permitted that on our own because now we're a little bit bigger and, and well off, but that cost me probably about $150,000 in two years. So when I started, I had $500 in my pocket and did my own permits. Can't tell that story today, so I'd like to see that changed. So. So we should buy more, more oysters. Yeah, and also just if you hear something about it, just like this is, a, you know, we, this is tailor-made for small, I mean, doesn't everybody, everybody doesn't have to become a hog island. This is a, a good lifestyle business for okay. mom and pop, and I, I'd like to see more of it. And there is some area in Tomales Bay we could, you know, the, the frame of reference actually is at one point in time, Tomales Bay had 1,100 acres under lease for shellfish culture. Today, there's half of that under lease. Part of that is because the south end of the bay, the hydrology is different, and that will never grow good oysters again. But part of it is it's just too onerous to even add on uh, five acres here, 10 acres there, and that's what I'd like to see change. Hmm. So one of the questions uh, is a question I actually have, too, which is that when I was younger, people often said, don't you dare eat oysters when, with, without an R in the month. Months without R, And meanwhile, yeah. it's like your place is packed through the summer. So is that an East Coast phenomenon? Is that a myth, or what is that? Well, if you think about... There's truth to it. There's okay. truth to it. So, so the summertime is when oysters are putting energy into reproductive, you know, to, to, to eggs and sperm or whatever. If they're in an area where they're naturally spawning, they're going to become fatter and softer in texture. And if they actually spawn, they become very thin and watery and very not very good to eat. Um, and if you want to have, if you're counting on natural settlement, you don't want to be harvesting oysters right when they're getting ready to do that. So that was one reason back in the day. But it also had to do with the fact that, you know, back in the day, we, we, you know, it's summertime, you've got warm water temperatures, it wasn't good refrigeration, you have warmer air temperatures, all those things led to that. If you fast forward to today, you know, we're producing our seed in a hatchery. Our oysters in Tamales Bay will actually get what we call a spawny, which is fatter and softer in texture. But it's very interesting. We, we have four separate leases in Tamales Bay, and they go through that cycle at different times. So we can usually always find oysters that are in good condition. It's also why we grow the eastern oyster. The eastern oyster is used to very big temperature swings on each coast. We don't get that, mm -hmm. so they don't go through that 
out here. It gets harder if you if if you if you're around my restaurants a lot, you'll notice in the wintertime I'll have eight varieties of oysters on the menu. Now we might have three or four. So it does get harder to get good quality oysters in the summertime, but it's not impossible. And then back in the day when we did a lot of national distribution, we would not sell oysters across the country. I used to tell people it's like transplanting a tree in the summertime. The shelf life isn't gonna be there, it's just not a good thing. So harder, so there's some truth to it, but it's not absolute. There's a lot of oyster uh, growers on the East Coast, and whenever I've gone to the, um, what's the train station, Oyster Bar? Grand Central Oyster Grand Bar. Grand Central. Mm -hmm. They have something, 30, 40 varieties there. Is that because there are lots of small growers in the inlets and rivers up the East Coast? Well, I think par part of it is that the East Coast has a, has a, has a much um, bigger shellfish history if you will, in terms of, you know, you think about Chesapeake and, yeah. and even New York Harbor at one point in time and, and, and Cape Cod and all those areas where there were a natural shellfish inland fishery. Um, and then, like I said, now what happened is, is, say, in the Chesapeake, where they finally realized they need to allow people to farm oysters because they were some of the people who were wild harvesting oysters were actually opposed to leasing areas for farming. That's totally changed now to where even on the East End Long Island where I'm from, where back in 1983, it would have been next to impossible for me to start a new farm. There are now 40 shellfish farms on the East End Long Island, New York. So there's been a big surge in shellfish farms in the East Coast in the last, I'd say, decade and a half. That's incredible. So uh, one of the questions is a very speculative one, and it goes back to your slide about uh, sustainability and I think regenerative, did mm -hmm. you say regenerative mm -hmm. farming? Good, I was paying attention. <laughs> um, is there a possibility of cleaning up the Richmond Alameda shorelines? Can we ever grow oysters again in San Francisco Bay? Great, great question. So we've been part of efforts, a few efforts, to try to see if we can restore Olympia oyster populations, namely in San Francisco Bay. And there's actually a coastal conservancy, um, and I can't remember what year this came out, has a subtitle Habitat Goal paper that they put out where they're trying to create more eelgrass in the bay and more habitat by planting more oysters. They're trying to focus on the Olympia oyster, yep. <laughs> which has some challenges because A, as I talked about earlier, they're slow growing, they're smaller. One of the other things we're finding out is they, there are populations of Olympia oysters that don't spawn and recreate young every year. It's every, every three to four year cycle. So if you don't keep a critical mass going. So um, there are definitely places in, in San Francisco Bay you could, you could grow oysters and I always, you know, some of the even areas in San Francisco Bay with improved water quality, you might even be able to grow oysters that you could, you could eat. But um, there's, there's a lot of debate around what oyster to grow. You know, the Pacific oyster is a non-native oyster. It has naturalized in some areas. Some regulators are fearful of them becoming invasive, which they haven't done on the, on the West Coast of the United States. So there's a lot of, lot of discussion around that. So if there's anyone in the audience that wants to do that, you would be happy to advise them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But you're not going to do it. I'm not going to do that. Right? I got that. So do you have big expansion? I mean, it sounds like you are expanding up in Humboldt, but, you know, how does it, how do you look at it moving forward? Yeah, it's funny. It's uh, the, the, the term succession planning wasn't in our lexicon until a couple of years, a few years ago, and then the pandemic hit and that went on, on hold. And so we're trying to get into that. I think... As I mentioned, we had, we had and still have no vision that this company is gonna be a certain size. Um, we got into the restaurant business as a way to make the company more financially secure. And of course the pandemic happened and we all know what happened there, but it, it really helped. The, the whole vertical integration has helped us become resilient. Um, there's no immediate plans. Uh, we have a, a site in Petaluma we're gonna to try to develop for a commissary kitchen and maybe a small restaurant and, and doing this. We stayed away from doing mail order business and shipping oysters around the country for years and years because I didn't like the idea of putting oysters in a styrofoam box and sending them around. The pandemic sort of changed that a little bit. We now have recycled cardboard packaging and it's going to be a part of our future. Um, more restaurants, we'll, we'll see. You know, I think uh, we're really intrigued with the, the seaweed aspect of what we could do. In addition to harvesting the seaweed that occurs naturally in our gear, uh, we're involved in a couple of pilot projects in Humboldt Bay for um, culturing kelp up there as well. Um, we're also playing around with producing sea salt out of Tamales Bay. Um, and we'll see. We'll see what comes beyond that. So, 
So soon we're going to be sampling some oysters on the fourth floor. Are they going to be sweet waters, do you think? I believe so. I should have checked in with <laughs> my guys before that. Okay. Well, you call, you call a boss. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's say from the moment they're discernible as an oyster, let's say, oh, a little seed oyster, to what we're going to get tonight. How much time has passed? So those oysters are probably going to be about a year and a half old. And it's interesting because we actually do things to slow them down. Yeah. So when you start in the business, you think fast growth is great growth. You're going to turn your equipment over faster, all that kind of thing. But I can't remember what the phenomenon is, but when a group of something is growing very quickly, you get a lot more variability in size and shape, which is not what you want. Um, the other thing is just quality. So you can grow a Pacific oyster in Tomales Bay submerged the entire time. You could grow it to what we call a small in nine months. But you could break that shell in half with your hands, and the meat quality isn't going to fully develop what we want it to develop. So we think it takes to about a year and a half before they really develop the meat quality that we want. Yeah. That's the, for the Pacific oysters. The Kumamotos are two plus years, and the Eastern oysters are two and a half plus years to get the market size. Okay. So I, when I was a kid, and I'm from here, uh, no one really, we never really saw raw oysters. They came in a jar. Right. And they were largely produced by Johnson's Oyster Farm out in Point Reyes, kind of a crazy family. And the oysters were like, they were like that big. What in the world was that? <laughs> what, was it really an that, oyster or was it an alien? Yeah, well, that's a, the same oyster that we're going to have up top. It's just that but was the more elderly. Method. That was the more elderly. That was the culture method. They were grown in clusters. And by the time you could break them off as singles, oh, I see. they were that big. And so that's... That's that uphill battle we had to fight in the beginning, going, hey, we have these specific oysters we're going to sell you to put on your raw bar menu. You're like, no thanks. You right. know, we had quite a bit of that going on in the early 80s. So, so the jar oyster has almost disappeared. It's almost impossible to find them anymore. It's like still for fried oysters. It's still pretty big. So in Washington State, a lot of people have moved to this single seed production. You can actually, you know, get a much more. I, I didn't get into the detail, but when you grow the oysters the old-fashioned way. Yeah. It's, it's the, the seed cost is very low, the growing cost is very low, but your yield is low, and then you have a high processing cost because you're shucking everything in the jars, and then you get less per oyster. When you do it our way, it's higher seed costs, higher growing costs because you're handling them, higher yields, lower processing costs because you're just sorting them by size, and you get two to three times per oyster. However, there's still, out on the coast in Washington State, Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor, that is still... 50% of the West Coast production is still being shucked into jars up there. Okay. And oysters as a, as a commodity being shipped all over the world. So two final questions, and mm -hmm. then we're going to rush upstairs and get some wine and oysters, because I can see people looking at me. Uh, the first question is, um, oh, if I can remember what the question was. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? I thought it was it's called, me. It's called real time. <laughs> it's called it's, aging. Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself, my dear. CRS. No, I, I know what it was. It was, it was a cl slightly controversial question, which is why I forgot it. Um, if, you, if you go to an oyster bar and there's a professional who's shucking an oyster and they open it up and they look at it, presumably they will know if that's a healthy oyster, right? So it, how, how does a person know? Let's say you go to a cheaper restaurant or something. Can you get a bad oyster, and would you know before you ate it? Because I've heard sometimes people go, oh, I had a bad oyster and had food poisoning. How do you know that that's going to make you sick? So I, I wish it was an easy answer. It's, it's not quite an easy, that easy. That's why it's so the second if, to the if, last if, one. If somebody, <laughs> it's easy if someone's mishandling product. Yeah. That, that you can tell. If an oyster is dried out, if it has an odor, those kind of, none of that should happen. But that's really a handling thing. If there was a pollution event or, or, or some other thing that happened, you wouldn't necessarily know that in an oyster, which is why it's good to go to a place and ask questions and make sure they know something about oysters. Where did these come from? You could even say, can I see the tag? When were they were harvested? Where are they from? Go to places that go through a lot of oysters. You know, I, I, I mean, that's how you, you want to trust. You're eating raw animal protein. You want to know that the people who are serving it know what they're doing. It's why, for instance, you know, one of the reasons besides that we always knew we wanted to do a restaurant, you know, we, we still sell some oysters wholesale to other restaurants, 
but I don't do that through the regular chain of custody because I want to. I sell direct to restaurants who have our oysters on the menu, and that is it, because we take a lot of care. You know, we have a UV sterilized, chilled, filtered seawater system that all our oysters go into. I'm not just going to hand those oysters to somebody else. We want to make sure we know exactly where they're going, um, and and that's the best way is to go to a place that's like that. Go to Hog Island. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're about to go to Hog Island. <laughs> so the final question is a, is a great question for you, which is, what, what are the, what are the, what's the last main point you'd like this audience to know about? What should we walk out of this room thinking about? You know, that I, and it's funny, being involved in the restaurant business and, and sourcing other things besides some shellfish, I mean, what we eat matters as, as, a, as a race, and is going to continue to matter more and more and more as we go forward. You know, the, the, the environmental impacts of what foods we choose to eat. And I guess, you know, local is always better. I think it's something about 20% of the, of the carbon footprint of most foods is the transportation side. Okay. That's, that's you know, no small chump change. But still, you know, knowing something about it. We have a, a saying in our company, you know, we try to be local and organic and all these things, but there are no absolutes. But what we want is I want all my chefs and all my people asking questions. Know where your food comes from. No, you know, ask the questions that matter to you. Is it using a lot of fresh water? Is it, is it, you know, adding to to global warming? Those kinds of things. Because I think increasingly it's going to matter how we how we get it, sort, produce our food. Well, you have 120 judges in the room, <laughs> so uh, let's give a round of applause to John Finger. Thank you. And we'll meet you upstairs on the fourth floor. Thank you. <laughs>